اوكي ابو شمس السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته مسيو مراكو I'm back مسيو مراكو I'm, I'm full of طاجين <تصفيق> طاجين طاعش تاع الدجاج الدجاج والزيتون Do you know what? I don't think I had any sort of طاجين in a, you know like the actual طاجين the utensil mm. that you cook in whatever you want to call it oh, I don't think I had anything like that mm, They don't use it so much anymore I don't think No everything else is cooked in Pressure cooker. But I did have. They use pressure yeah, I cooker did. instead. Oh my god! I just shook the whole table. I apologize to the listeners. Uh-huh. Let me warn everyone in advance. Oh. I'm very ill, so I'm coughing a lot. I like right, I'll try and I'll try. I mean, I'll try and cough away from the mic. Mm, I also got coffee. Know. I'll try not to slurp, <laughs> and I've got some. I've got some wafer rolls that mm. the we worst, shouldn't be eating. The worst thing <laughs> would be if you had. Those sunflower seeds that you just nibble on oh, for hours. Bro. Oh man, you can't stop, can you? <laughs> yeah, man. So, yeah, bro. I thought you were going to Morocco for two weeks, but it's been one week, right? Yeah, because I'm back at work on Wednesday. Mm. So that was planned. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't know how. I knew that I had a week off work, but I didn't know that I had a few days as well. Mm. Like my shift doesn't start until Wednesday, so I wasn't a hundred percent sure until recently, and I was like, "Oh, I could have stayed for a few days longer." Mm. But no, okay. from Saturday till Saturday, okay. which incidentally is the day we record. So, mm. yeah, that's why I had to. It's been a bit of a dodge one. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, this is episode fifty, I think, isn't it? This oh, episode wow. fifty. Alhamdulillah. Oh, I mean, it probably should be episode a hundred, but we'll we'll go with fifty. <laughs> It is what it is, man. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah to reach 50. I mean, that's about, if we obviously were doing a weekly, it's it's nearly a year's worth of podcasts. So it's pretty good, man. Wow. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And there are many podcasts uh, out there around this mark, you know, like I saw Enfeed, they reached uh, 40. So they, they started oh, wow. a, a lot later than us, but they've ju- just been very consistent. Um, uh, what's it called? Islam 20 on C, I think they're on uh, 25. So, you know. Yeah, it's about quality, not quantity, isn't it? So yeah, ideally we've both. Got, we've got <laughs> we've got a lot of loyal listeners. That although the numbers show that we have many listeners, we we barely hear from them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, having said that, I didn't I didn't get round to answering some of the comments or questions last episode, um, but maybe we'll get into that this episode. What? Um, how far did you get into episode 49 listening to that? So, let's have a look. Um, no, 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 no. Oh, no, that's the wrong app completely. I am, um, oh, I'm one hour and eight minutes. So, basically, what, 18 minutes left. Oh, okay. What are your I thoughts? I listened to it just earlier. Oh, I really liked it, man. But it's it's a dangerous one to listen to when you've just come back from... you know because i'm already in a mood to go back and i'm like why am i here and it always happens as soon as i come back to the uk from either tunisia or morocco wherever i am Mm. i just think what the hell am i doing here (laughs) why am i back (laughs) um but you know what i think a lot of that is also this false sort of um illusion that when you're there you're in holiday mode right Mm. it might not always be that you're missing the Muslim lands. You're just missing the holiday. Right, the yeah, true. You know, because I always associate Muslim lands mm. with not doing anything. That's true. Not working, not, you know, just relaxing or the masjid or mm. enjoying myself, whatever. So, yeah, there's always going to be that link. But it's kind of like what Kaya said. Like, he's never worked in Dubai, mm. so he doesn't know what it's actually going to be like, the yeah. nine to five of it or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so... Um, not to go on too much of a tangent, I think, yeah, first and foremost, I need to achieve uh, a specific type of, um, you know, income plan in terms of self-employment or owning my own business or whatever mm. before I make that jump over there. Mm. Before or... Well, it depends where you're going, I suppose. It depends like, where I'm going. Yeah, and then, obviously, yeah. if, you, if you were to come over here, um, th- there are some very good jobs over here. I know that. So yeah, depends where you're going, basically. Uh, in Morocco, what are the you know what do you know about in terms of job opportunities there? Like, are the jobs Absolutely. but the salaries are terrible, or I really don't know. Um, okay, 
it's a very I don't really know that many people that work in Morocco in a sense like mm-hmm. like my grand's there so she's you know retired and mm. I don't think she ever worked there yeah I think most of her working life was in the UK uh, okay. um, I've got a cousin who's just started working basically the two people that do work there mm. in terms of the men mm. um, they both sort of own their own businesses so one yep. of them I don't know if he's already retired or he, he owns a car wash mm. so it's his own business the other one owns like um, a, a car rental place mm. So essentially, they both own their own business. So I see the I see them all the time. So it's not like someone that I know that goes to work yes. um, nine to five. So it's very difficult to to understand that. I mean, um, in Algeria, it's it's potentially more common to be self employed than employed because mm. just lack of jobs. Really, you got to create your own job. Yeah, I'm looking. I'd be at- interested to see how money management works over there, and because. You see people living, yeah, but you just don't know t- to what extent and yeah. what their expenditures are like and stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's hard to have that conversation with anyone anyway. I mean, yeah, sensitive topic. I think in uh, I've spoken to my friends like in Egypt, uh, in Algeria. I think in these countries, there's a lot of helping out each other. Like, right. I don't know, for example, like uh, one of my cousins, he lives in one of his father-in-law's like second or third properties you know like that helps him out kind of thing um so people are just like helping each other out um people are living with parents people are you know what i mean like it's if if you were actually living the more western lifestyle where it's like you your wife and then your kids and you're kind of on your own then a lot of people would be just dying bro poverty so it's like do you need to have the structure in place to there where you're helping each other out, I think, to survive? Yeah, definitely. I'm looking at the cost of living in uh, Tanja compared to Dubai. So it says, uh, how can we... Uh, so you would need $1,750 in Tanja to live the same standard of living with $4,900 in Dubai. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh wow! Consumer prices are fifty percent lower than Dubai. Uh, rent prices are eighty-four percent lower than Dubai. Grocery prices are forty-six percent lower than in Dubai. So basically, half price living. But then, when it comes to the actual purchasing power, so it says local purchasing power in Tanja is sixty-three percent lower than Dubai. So it's that yeah. typical typical setup, really. Less money to make, but much cheaper to live i mean it's pretty this is something i noticed there like tanja specifically because my family's from Laraish, mm. um which is a small sort of i say yeah. small it's quite a decent sized mm. um town yeah but tanja is like like a city yeah but it's not it's not like the capital it's not you know yeah. medium right it, yeah but it's when i was there bro it's incredible like it's just an incredible place okay um i don't know why more people don't visit there because that's where I would want to go. Mm. Like, forget Marrakesh and and you know other places. Like, although mm. it depends, it depends what you're after. If you want like really heavily embedded culture, then yeah, they're going to be old school places mm. that, you, that are going to have that kind of like uh, you guys were mentioning about Istanbul. Like, Istanbul is way more historical, isn't it? So, mm. if that's what you want to see, but in terms of living, mm. bro, like Tanja is where I'd want to live. Right. I wouldn't want to live in Mar- Marrakesh or anything. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah. Allah knows best. Allah knows best. That's that's the vibe I get. Like the north is just nicer man i think it's something to do with it being less of an industrial side of the city uh, of the country and it's more of a Mm. farming fishing kind of place right yeah definitely um i know i know about tatuan as well is tatuan bigger or smaller than uh Tatuan, i don't know i don't know much about it you're not been around there have you been chef showing no my family have so my sisters my mom oh man we wanted to go this this week as well but um it just wasn't enough time yeah. and those kind of journeys are a bit long i think in morocco right yeah yeah you probably get a coach or something maybe a few hours three hours four hours in a coach it's a bit long it's too long bro but you know just got me thinking man just listening to that episode got me thinking again mm. not that i don't think i always think yeah mashallah <laughs> 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 um it'd be interesting to see what i've you know the other listeners are thinking and I, like i said to you in that voice note earlier mm. um 
what Kaya said about like if you don't do it, then who else will? Mm. And if you don't take the difficult plunge, yeah, and it's it is a difficult plunge, um, mm. but it's not a it's not one I want to take blindly. So, like I said to you, and I think it's good for the listeners to hear, um, you've got to think long and hard. And and I said that there was a friend of mine that moved to Egypt, and um, it'd be interesting to just quickly gloss over his life. So he he started practicing here quite late in his. Uh, maybe twenties, mm. maybe I don't know. He started practicing around about the same time I did, but he's older than me, mm. so yeah, maybe about twenty five or so. He started practicing and started taking the dean seriously. Now his family are from Egypt. Uh, they his dad owns like a farm and land there, um, and he started studying here mm. agriculture. Right. Um, so he was making good amount of money, bro. Mm. Um, here. And he was housed, like a proper house, like a cottage. Yeah. So they put him in a cottage all on his own. Mm. Um, and, you know, rent-free stuff. And he's making about, I don't know, 24, 25K. Mm. Um, which, without rent, is yeah, brilliant. very nice, yeah. Because, you know, you can just... But the thing is, he had it in his mind to go to Egypt. And that's all he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of like... Although I, 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 I can relate to that because I want to go to Tunisia or whatever... Mm. I thought, well, there's no point going if you're not going to take advantage of what you have here. Mm. Like either send stuff over there or set up something here so you can benefit from it while you're over there mm-hmm. or build something over there from here. Yeah, You know? Yes. Those sort of things. Mm. But from what I know, and Allah knows best, he just sort of went. You know, he just took the plunge and went mm. um, because he felt like it's the right thing to do. He was focusing on Arabic and all this stuff. And this reminds me, sorry, to sort of go on a slight tangent, but it reminds me of what Kai said about, well, what's the point of saying I'm going to go over there to learn Arabic if I don't do it here? Yes, yes. You know? And I don't think, although he was talking a lot about going over there to study, I don't think he's actually manifested that since being there for the past three <laughs> or four years. Okay. So, um, so how's he making a living over there? So he's obviously working on the farm that his dad has and mm. stuff. Um but he's, you know, I just got off the phone with him and he was talking about how he wished he'd started something over here and he's still trying to, even though it's really mm. hard. Yes. Um, but he can't come back here because once you're there and you haven't got any sort of outside income, you can't really afford plane tickets to just come whenever you want. <laughs> Mad, yeah, and yeah. once you've taken the plunge, you can't really come here because you've got nowhere to stay. You've got no, you can't just, do you understand? Mm, that's true. Um, yeah, if, if you don't And now that he's, or... he's due to get married in a week or so so because okay. i suggested well why don't come back here and work try and work back at the farm again and send money over like yeah, just sort yeah. of but he said well i'm gonna about to get married would you leave your wife and come over to the uk mm. i was like well bro a lot of a lot of the old school generation do that yeah, yeah you know a lot of them still do that mm. um but you know i'm not telling him to do that it's just mm. it's the reality situation so yeah this is basically the lesson is that you gotta think long and hard about it and if you can if you can take something with you or benefit I mean, let's think about it, right? We've we've lived here for however many years, at least I have anyway, mm-hmm. and I've injected enough into the system that why wouldn't I want to take something, like benefit off of it by going over there with something, you know? Like, what all do you these mean taxes by that? Are, take? In terms of, okay, like the the economy here, mm. we've, we've we've not only just worked for this country mm. or, the, or the West, mm. but we've also injected a lot of our money in taxes and stuff here. Okay, yeah. Right? Um, to pick up and go mm. and start again somewhere else means that all of that sort of injection that you've put in has right. sort of gone to waste, mm. right? Um, unless you're going to, you know, you've got pensions and stuff like that, which even that is another, that's another episode in itself. <laughs> um, talk about pensions and stuff. But um, yeah, like basically the, 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 the way I think about it is like, yeah, my dad or my parents, they struggle to get over here for economic reasons, right? Mm. Uh, my dad more so than my mum. My mum came because her father brought them here. Mm. But my dad made the decision to come here mm. for economic reasons. Now, it would be a wasted opportunity to sort of not take advantage of what a lot of uh, Muslims from the Arab world try and come over to Europe for, right? Mm. Mm. Um, and a lot of people will say that to you when you go over there. They will say, oh, why would you want to stay here and the money and this and then that? And yeah, they're all thinking about dunya, right? Mm. Um, but just going over to the UAE or Tunisia or wherever, just with a red passport, mm-hmm. doesn't make your life any better. You just end up becoming the same as everyone else. Yes. You've got to take advantage of the skills, the connections, the the everything that you can mm. from here yeah. and, and set up over there. Because let's think about it, bro. Without cutting any, beating around the bush, 
UK and Europe and France and everyone took advantage of our countries mm -hmm. to get to where they are at now. Uh -huh. Right? They built they built their empires mm. on our backs. Yeah. Like who was the workforce? Who did they take advantage of? Fair play. They don't like you know. There's a a decent population of this country that don't want immigrants here and they don't want us here. Mm. But they wouldn't be living the life they were mm. if it wasn't for us and it mm. wasn't for our labor. So yeah, I will take what I can get and I'll although, take it back to the lands that were from. Although it wasn't us, it was our, you know, more like my Ancestors. dad's generation and then his dad's generation. Of course, yeah, of course. But we are, you know, obviously like like you already know, we are the the descendants of those generations mm. and we're sort of the, the the seed that bites back sort of thing because yeah we will take our investments elsewhere or whatever mm. um, I mean, we, we've us... got that option isn't it like if we're exactly if we're exposed to different parts of the world whereas other people are only exposed to the one place that you know that they were born and raised in then mm. yeah we, we have more options definitely mm. um, so it's difficult, man, because like what you said, a lot of people, actually, the dad will be in one place because that's where it's good to be making a living. And mm. then he'll have his wife and kids in another place. So that's like the best, better place to like grow up and for education. So right. it's like, but then you're split up. So it's really not ideal. Um, but you know, Rob, that's the thing. Yeah, I feel like our whole generation, especially, you know, my generation, your generation, I guess we're the same generation. Um and then the people a bit younger than us as well, like we're really discovering what it means to live in a more and more globalized world. Like it's really a new, a new thing. Like it's so new. It's so weird, bro. It's like, yeah, you've got all these options of global living, if you like, for example, right now, if you're, if you don't have access, let's say you're not European, right? You're not European. You're not um, North American. Yeah. You can open, you could get what's called a, an e-residence in Estonia. And what it allows you to do is it doesn't give you the right to live in Estonia. It allows you to open a business in Estone, Estonia and have an EU business because Estonia is in the EU, right? And you can right. do all of this online. So now you have access to, you, you basically you're able to be an EU business, which means you can get EU banking services, um, stuff like a Stripe account, which a lot of the time is similar to PayPal. It's a very common way of getting paid online. A really, right. really good tool. If you don't live in a lot of these more quote unquote developed countries, you wouldn't have access to something like Stripe. So Estonia is one of the kind of pioneering countries in in really actually trying to benefit because they obviously make some money out of this e-resident scheme. But they're thinking, okay, there are people who want to, kind of join this this global uh, business kind of uh, world, if you like, but they don't have the right citizenship for it. So let's give them a citizenship for it, right? We're not going to allow them to live here per se, but they can use our country to start a business and we're also going to benefit financially. So this is like one experiment in many that we're going to see happening around the world where mm. now it's like you've got to justify more why people should do business in your country or why people should live in your country because it's been so become so easy to move around that people kind of need to now justify like no no stay in my country it's better than those countries you know what i mean definitely bro so the, the look, so I mean, much look at us on. now like right now bro this wouldn't have been happening mm. 30 years ago like imagine if my nice was i don't know a business yeah right and you know where am i i'm sitting on i'm sitting at the edge of, of brighton like the sea is right yeah. in front of me. I can see it out yeah. the window. Yeah. And you're God knows where, <laughs> yeah. what, whatever direction. Yeah. And we're talking and we're doing, you know, you know, we're producing this content. We're producing this podcast, mm. uh, which, you know, could be seen as like a radio show or whatever. Yeah. And, it, it, and theoretically, it could be a consistent money-making employment yeah. thing, yeah. you know, which would never happen in a million years, bro. Mm. Um, what was I listening to recently about... Uh, Maybe I was listening to a, a lecture or something where they were just talking about how I think it was about like shortening prayers and, and, and you know, when you're traveling and, and just traveling in general mm. in, in the light of Islam. Um, God, I can't remember where I read it. It might have been a book or something. Uh, they were just talking about like how traveling as well, like to travel somewhere. Oh, it was on Reddit. It was on Reddit. Okay. It was, I was reading an article on Reddit about someone had asked 
asked them, how did people meet up uh, when they were traveling, like back in like antiquity or whatever? Mm. So in like Rome or mm. how would you go and meet some scholar somewhere? Mm. Yeah. Um, when you couldn't even contact them, like yeah. how would you just know where to be? And they were so, they, the historians there were discussing that traveling back then was so different to now mm -hmm. it was impossible to just pick up and go like mm -hmm. you'd have to plan your track your trip for a good six months before you did it you'd have to mm -hmm. save the money you'd have to plan your route you'd have mm -hmm. to send messages back and forth mm -hmm. like whether it was through you know messenger pigeons or whatever yeah and generally speaking rarely did people travel long term mm -hmm. um unless you were like a trader a trader would follow trade routes um which were known and established uh -huh. and there would be points uh, stoppage points that you could probably find them at but mm. people living in a town would would live and die there for most, all of their life yeah like rarely would you find someone that moved mm. unless there was some massive sort of mm, motivation know, a plague or, or, or mm. a war or something that may, meant people would flood from one area to another yeah but they would always flood to settle um now that's different with nomadic cultures and stuff but nomadic cultures didn't really engage with the vast majority of society as much they had their own sort of mm. inner tribal sort of stuff mm. um and they would do trading and stuff like that but yeah it was just fascinating to see uh that yeah the people did the, those who did took it in such a it was such an immense thing which yeah. puts things into perspective how mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on those that travel by answering their du'as or allowing them to shorten their yeah, prayers or, yeah. or join their prayers or stuff like that traveling wasn't just what we'd have today where we can literally just pick up and go mm -hmm. um, and it made me think because you guys were talking on the podcast about um Oh yeah, which country do you want to travel to? And it was so casual, kind of thing. Oh yeah, I've been mm -hmm. to, you, you know, I've been to Turkey, I've been to this, I've been to that. And I was talking <laughs> to my wife. I was like, oh, we've been married because you know we have these expectations. And and me and my wife, yeah, we we are on social media and stuff. And sometimes we fall victim into seeing people traveling a lot. And we're like, oh, I wish we could do that. And then I put it into perspective, and I was like, well, we've been married for what three or four years, but we've traveled to we've traveled at least five times some yeah. of them to the same country but we've gone abroad at least five times yeah and i was like my great grandparents have probably never left the country yeah. <laughs> Do you know what i mean yeah. and i was just putting that into perspective like mm. there's people that have never ever ever people would have mm. thought that i was a millionaire back then yeah, yeah. you know uh, thinking of all the amount I've, I've traveled and how quickly i've traveled and what i've achieved um it's just putting things into perspective yeah man it's uh, crazy but yeah it's, it's, you, like, it's a lot of time we live in. it's a lot of blessing and it's a lot of responsibility as well because if you have the freedom to travel then uh, if you just imagine uh, obviously i i can't speak on behalf of them right but the sahaba imagine you told the sahaba like you can travel from here from medina to china in 10 hours yeah mm. what do you think they would the first thing they would think of they probably would think something like, okay, let's go, let's go do da'wah, let's go spread Islam over there. You yeah. know, like they'd be, they'd be on it. They'd be like, wow, this is such a big opportunity to, to do good. And like, you know, that's, that's what would be their mindset. Um, and it's like taking their mindset and applying it to our abilities today and then yeah. see where, how does that play out? That's actually really interesting. Uh, Definitely. If, if we... I guess if we knew more about the Sahaba, we, w we would maybe be more able to apply that. No doubt there are people doing it. Um, I was looking a little bit into like book publishing and I was looking a little bit about the, you know, the books that English speaking Muslims are putting out there. For example, there's uh, Sheikh Musa Ferber. Have you heard of him? Possibly. Yeah. He's, Let me have a quick Google search, but yeah, carry on. Yeah, he's, um, I've noticed, you know, he's been translating a lot of uh, very kind of, you could call it classic books, like very important books that are mostly in Arabic. Like he's been translating them to English and consistently been putting out books. Um, I found out he's actually publishing himself. He like made his own publishing company and stuff. He's American, I think, but he lives in Malaysia. And like, he's like, you know, this is maybe a taste of what it means to take that Sahaba mentality and apply it to the crazy things you can achieve, you know, in these this day and age, Annie. Yeah. Mm. And I'm not saying like day and age as if I'm like 70 years old and things have changed. So it's just that like I'm just kind of aware like that things change so quickly. They're changing so quickly. It's almost like the defining thing about our generation that 
this is the generation where we had to start getting used to things changing so quickly. Before yeah. that, like our parents' generation, it just really wasn't like that. It was starting to speed up, but that's why I'm saying day and age because just 10 years ago, I feel like things were just so different, you know? So it's kind of nuts. It's kind of nuts, Allah. Definitely, bro. Like, can you imagine, you know, <laughs> I think Kaya again mentioned, I keep referencing Kaya, but I've really enjoyed the podcast so far and I think he's a brilliant guest to have on. Um, he was talking about what it would be like in 2030 or 2040 when you know our kids are teenagers or whatever mm. lord knows bro because just in the 10 years that we've been here the last 10 years have been so crazy in terms of technology and like comparing just to something as simple as a smartphone like mm. I remember before smartphones and you know I'm still still in living memory obviously still can recall it quite well how social dynamics worked before smartphones and how or even before phones in general like how you met up with people and what you would do and mm -hmm. comparing it to now it's just insane yeah like, i was running businesses purely from my phone <laughs> yeah like i was doing everything from my phone yeah everything not just the you know the emails and the the processing orders and stuff like that mm. bro i was Flipping producing artwork on my phone. Yeah. Right? It's <laughs> my, insane. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's so... Yeah. It's it, it, comparing the amount of like applications that were available when the iPhone, for example, first launched to mm. now. Mm. It's insane, bro. Yeah. It's insane. And it, it, it's amazing how like... It's a gift and a curse. Like It's amazing how having internet access on your phone mm. in, a, in, a, in a country like... You know, in a country like North Africa can completely change the way you travel. Mm. Um for example, I remember a few years ago, like I wouldn't explore Morocco that much mm. uh, because I didn't really know my way around. I was worried I'd get lost or taken advantage of whatever. Mm. And then it was the first time I went to Morocco and I got a SIM card there. So I had internet access there yeah. on a smartphone and it just yeah. transformed everything. Mm. Google because Maps, thought, everything. Exactly. I thought, oh, they wouldn't have Google Maps here. Like, of course they wouldn't. Yeah. And they did. And yeah. I, you know... I got on a taxi and there was like some sort of protest or riot or something after a football match. Mm. Basically, all the roads were closed. Taxi driver got lost. Mm. And I was like, well, how am I going to get back home? Mm -hmm. And I just Google mapped it, bro. And I got yeah. home and I was like, whoa, this is insane. It was so unheard of to do that mm. over in, a, in, a, in a country like that. Um, it's just, it's, it's incredible, bro. It's incredible. And yeah, the curse of it all, though, is going back to the traveling thing is like... If, People just, you know, people just want to flip in, become travel bloggers and stuff, and mm. that's all that they learn from traveling. And um, one thing that I made a conscious decision not to do, and mm. Allah, Allah knows best if I succeeded, um, but was to go there and not be taking photos every five seconds. Yeah, like, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to just. I want to go there and enjoy the moment. Mm. You know? And I know it sounds really cliche, mm. but it's just the reality. Um, and it's difficult because. You know, my wife has got, um, she's all on, on social media and stuff, and she gets a lot of um, collaboration stuff. So they want to take photos uh, of products they send her. Mm. So we take advantage of the fact that we're going somewhere nice or in Morocco or whatever. So we do, mm. you know, a lot of photos like that. And it could be like Jibberbs, uh outfits, whatever. Um, and that's her sole reason for, for wanting to take photos. Yeah. Um, whilst myself, I could, you know, one minute you could argue, oh, well, why do I have social media? Well, it could be because I want more exposure to allow myself to get more opportunities that could, mm -hmm. um, more opportunities that could help me economically, right? Mm. But for a lot of people, that isn't the case. A lot of people, it's just pure. Mm. It's the default. Clout. Yeah, basically. Um, and to go there, and all you're doing is snapping photos every second. Mm. I mean, how often do you look through your photo album of stuff? And this is coming, mm. you know, for yourself. I mean, who hasn't got any sort of private social media, really? Mm. How often do you flick through your photo album mm. on your phone and looking back at all the places you visit? Probably not that often. Yeah, yeah. Um, and photos now, without getting into the permissibility of printing photos and photos of people and stuff, they mm. don't have the same meaning as they used to. For example, mm. at my grandmother's house in Morocco, mm. you know, she's quite old school. She's got a very big house. Mm. Houses, should I say? Allah alam. <laughs> <laughs> and... It's very old school in the sense there's photos everywhere in terms of like photos of us when we were kids, mm. photos of the family when they were kids, and they're all sort of there, yeah. just sort of propped up against <clears throat> certain things and in frames and stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking, 
the value that was given to photos before mm. just put you know put somewhere and that will be the same photo there forever yeah you know i can remember those photos since i was a kid being there mm. i'm not the same value that we give our photos now because yeah. we take so many of them and it's so quick to access yeah um that we don't even we don't even look at them we don't care about them because yeah. the photo has a very limited uh life cycle it gets posted it has about a day's worth of activity on it and mm. that's all we were after we didn't care about anything else yeah we just care about the likes and the shares mm. and whatever and the interesting quote underneath mm. it that's it i think you know now i take photos i think i, I even today i still i take photos to share it's not mm. really for me sometimes i enjoy trying to challenge myself to take a good photo okay but yeah. a lot of the time it's just to share so before when i had instagram i used to enjoy that part of it it's like share it's like what's the point of taking a photo unless i'm going to share it and let other people enjoy it or something like that so yeah. i used to do that i used to enjoy that really and these days i don't have instagram but i do still kind of do that sometimes i just i take photos purely thinking oh i'll send that to my mom i'll send that to this i'll send that to this person so I think sharing is is part of it, you know? It's like, that's mm. what I enjoy a lot, of, a lot of the time when I'm taking photos, that's what I'm thinking of. So once I've shared it, I can kind of delete it. Like, I don't mind, you know? It's, it's kind of just being able to share that moment. They see it, you see it, maybe a little comment on it here and there, and then, halas, forget it kind of thing. But you're right, it's, it's very different the way, the value given to it. And that's kind of a, it's a common trend of, what we have which is abundance right exactly. abundance in terms of photos we can take like we could take six photos of the same pose exactly and then pick which one is best right but yeah, on top yeah. of that going back to the countries thing this is part of the struggle you know i'm facing and, and many people that i know face is like i could live in probably 200 different countries on earth yeah which one do i live in like that's actually yeah proper yeah, 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 I, yeah. i'm not even going to call it first world problem it's like 21st century problems or something Definitely. globalized world problems i don't know uh, and it's actually causing real uh real issues with people because they have so much to choose from whether it's country to live in job career to go down um even stuff like on uh, these marriage apps like so many women to choose from uh it's actually causing uh paralysis like not choosing anything and yeah. not committing to anything it's like yeah. okay i'm gonna i'm gonna move to this country but it's only gonna be for six months and i'll see yeah, yeah. and you just you don't really want to fully invest because you know i've got all these other options and it's really it's a struggle and honestly like i've Word. seen this so true i've seen this uh, in many different contexts like oh uh, people ask me sometimes for career advice like one of the my guys listeners he recognized me he asked me about this and i could kind of get a sense of he's got so much to choose from right then uh friends of mine that often bro we we have long discussions between me and my friends about where do you want to live like where are you going to live where are you planning to live and it's like okay i've got option a b c d e and i'm just like re this and that so <laughs> um in so many contexts the the overall trend is like so much to choose from and just really kind of hesitant to commit to any given mm. choice isn't it and that hesitancy can stem a lot from the allotted time you have to do that certain thing. Mm. For example, uh, it comes with like books or entertainment or whatever. You know you've got an allotted time. So it could be, okay, here, here's an example and it always hits me. Uh, I've got like a couple of hours to myself, right? My wife's taken my son somewhere or she's at her family's and I've got like two hours to just do something, you know, completely on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, and just have you know some time to, to think and, and clear my head, right? And I struggle so much deciding mm. what I want to do yes. in that allotted time because I know I only have two hours mm. to do whatever it is I want to do mm -hmm. that I end up not doing anything mm. or I end up doing a million things yeah. but not finishing anything because I haven't, you know, whether that's lack of planning or whatever, but because there's too much choice. And and something I heard recently was how we've we've become a, a society or a people that have eliminated boredom. Yeah. To the extent that boredom isn't good, boredom isn't healthy. Mm. This is the concept, isn't it? Like we've done so much to eliminate boredom that it actually made me think. I can't remember the last time I'd sat down and I was bored. Yes. How I used to be when I was a kid. Yes. How you know 
wherever, wherever country I was in, um, I remember just having bouts of extreme boredom because I didn't have anything to do, mm-hmm. um, whether to entertain myself or whatever. And I was trying to think recently, when, when did that last happen? Mm. Um, because <laughs> uh, even even psych- even like biologically, like for example, like dopamine getting uh, what's the word? Like dopamine basically um, stimulating your brain or whatever. Mm. Um, it doesn't tend to happen when you do something. It's the anticipation just before mm. you do it. Yes. So it could be. Did he get that the from anticip- Atomic Habits? I think it was. I think yeah. it was. Yeah. Because I listened to so much stuff. I can't remember where it comes yeah. from all the time. Um, I think that's what he said. Yeah. It was like it's not the actual thing that you do that that sends that stimulation. It's the the anticipation just before it. So it's like, yeah. oh, I can go and I don't know, flip in, watch a movie, or play mm. a game, or read this book I've been dying to do, or whatever. Mm. But because the anticipation is what does it, mm. that anticip that stimulation quickly fades the moment you're doing it mm-hmm. and that's why you decide to do something else because mm-hmm. you anticipate doing something else instead yeah that's where the kick comes <clears throat> yeah um and this is why and that's the, the problem with choice this is why the hedonist will always be disappointed because pleasure is by almost by definition short-lived like it will mm-hmm. not last and that's why it's very interesting how obviously allah knows us exactly how how our brains are wired and allah mentions that jannah you have food that is always different. You always mm. get different. Whenever you taste the fruit, it's going to taste slightly different. So yeah. it's like there's no limit to the pleasure, if you like. There's no boredom. There's no. Whereas in the dunya, it's like, you know, I've had that thing. I've done that thing. And that's why you find people whose life purpose, wh- whether they say or don't say it, wh- <clears throat> when their life purpose is to. Uh, chase pleasure and, and uh, enjoyment um, they they often have to they go to weird things to start to, to find that buzz right they, yeah. they go to start like harming themselves jumping out of planes uh, challenge themselves in ridiculous ways you know uh, you, oh, yeah. you've probably seen these videos where people walk on skyscraper um, roofs or on the construction yeah. sites it's like what is that for obviously there could be many reasons for it but definitely one i would say is like you're just seeking bigger higher levels of pleasure yeah. to the point where you actually went nuts basically <laughs> yeah no so true so true and it's uh it's phenomenal because surely in the remembrance of allah do hearts find rest mm. right and and it's crazy because i'll get myself caught up in a whirlwind of emotion thinking about what i need to do in my life where I'm going, what mm. plans I have, you mm. know, the things that I desperately want in this dunya for the sake of Allah a lot of the time, mm. but it's mm. still, you know, it's still dunya stuff, isn't it? Like, you know, I want, I want to be able to stay with my family. I want to be able mm. to benefit them more and stuff like that. Uh-huh. But it, and, and a lot of that I do view it as for the sake of Allah, mm. but at the same time, it doesn't escape the fact that it is still contained in this dunya. These are all dunya things. Mm. Um, but the moment you relinquish a bit of that thought process and that control and you just think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, think about death, think about, mm. then suddenly it all just disappears. And that's why, I don't know if anyone follows, I, I had a bit of a mishap on Instagram, whatever, but I am still on there. But I posted um, this little medallion that I bought. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it? No. Nope. Okay, I bought this little medallion. I don't even know where I put it. I think it's in my bedroom. Um. And it says on it, it's a Latin thing at the top, and then on one side it says "Memento Mori," and then on the other side mm. it says, uh, "You could leave life right now." Okay. Right. <laughs> Memento Mori, yeah, proper Stoic yeah. vibe. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where I got it from. Actually, I got it from like the Daily Stoic store or whatever. Okay. But um, it was to basically keep in my pocket all mm. the time um, because it's quite it's quite large. Mm. Uh, bigger than a two pound coin mm. uh yeah quite large and it's always like i can always feel it there and like when i'm put my hand in my pocket whether to grab my phone or whatever it always it's always there sort of thing mm. um and the moment like the moment i touch it or the moment i feel it i remember what it is mm. do you know what i mean it's not like it's something yeah. that i can mistake for something else like i put my hand in my pocket and i get it out and i'm like oh it's that and immediately yeah. as soon as i touch it i remember death because that's what it says mm, on it very good you know 
<clears throat> so that's what I'm sort of using it for, mm. is to just constantly remind me of death. And I've done it before with my screensaver on my phone, for example, or my background, or yeah. be that. Um, I think when it's a physical object, though, it's harder to yeah. ignore. It's, it was. I think when I had it on my phone, mm. it. I don't know. It, it didn't give me. It didn't give me a positive thought about. Not that death can always be seen as a positive thing. Mm. It just made it a bit more morbid on my phone. I can't explain why. I don't know. It's just the mm. emotion. But having it as a physical object, mm. um, ad- r- r- dedicated that object solely to that purpose. Yes. Whilst my phone, like I could be doing anything on my phone. I could be watching videos with my kids. Yeah. You associate it with a lot of different things. A lot of different things. Yeah. So when that popped up, it sort of, not that it spoils what I'm doing. It's mm. just, it's odd. It's odd, mm. basically. But yeah, having something that's solely dedicated to that. Interesting. Um, Should we make an Arabic I'm, version of that? <laughs> this is it. So I remember. <laughs> this is bid'ah, uh, akhi. Come on. <laughs> Musa Adnan messaged me and he said, "Oh, you know, there's a market for this in the Muslim scene, and maybe I'm maybe I'm spilling my beans by saying it, but yeah, there is, and I'm sure mm. people would lap that stuff up because mm. there was a lot of people that were interested in that coin. Mm. Um, but I mean, it accomplishes know, a goal, I think, in the end. It accomplishes a goal. That's yeah. basically it. And mm. um, obviously, another I, way to do the same thing is to visit graveyards, which is specifically recommended. Um, exactly uh for men at least but um but obviously it's it's much rarer occasion that you would probably do that i suppose so of course very interesting actually bro i like that Mm. it's it's just a so this is the reason why i sort of set upon it wasn't because i mean yeah we all need to remember death and stuff but it was actually more for my mental health because i was just going crazy Mm. um thinking about I didn't realize it until recently that I was just getting sucked up into the dunya so much. Mm. But under the guise, I wouldn't say complete guise, but under the, you know, the guise that it's all for the sake of Allah, mm. which I still believe it is. Mm. But sometimes you can just go crazy with it. Like I have all these goals, aspirations, and things I want to achieve in the dunya, and I keep telling myself it's for Allah, it's for Allah, it's for my family, it's for Allah. You know what I mean? It's for mm-hmm. these reasons to be a better Muslim, to be able to practice more, to be able to. X, Y, Z more. But right now, what am I doing for that? Right now, what am I doing for Allah? Right Mm. now, I might not reach the next hour. I might not reach the next second. So between now and the next five seconds, what have I done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If I'm going to be judged on that, you know, Mm -hmm. and one could argue that, yeah, you're working hard and Allah will reward you for your intention because in the long term, you want to seek to better your deen and better Mm. the situation and circumstances you live in for the sake of your deen, for the sake of Mm. Allah. It's the same reason you guys were talking about move into an Arab country or a Muslim country, sorry, uh, so they can better your children's Islam and things like that. Mm. But if life was to cut off right now, what have you done? Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, have you hit have you hit that milestone? You haven't. What have you yeah. done up to that milestone? Not as much. I think I think that's why you know, subhanAllah, Sir Sir Masters, the tagline is developing the Muslim mindset for success, right? So I think, bro, like Islam doesn't demand too much from people in terms of action, right? It doesn't demand that you do X, Y, Z and like so, so much of it, um, depending on the person, right? But the, 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 the whole way that what basically what, what Islam demands of you is that you live life according to what's pleasing to Allah, right? And that the thing is, that's so different for each person, Okay what islam demands of you is that in your capacity you live life that pleases allah right and so the true mindset basically if you have an islamic mindset everything else will follow yeah and i think the essence of the islamic mindset is not to say i want to fast i want to do dawah i want to serve my family it's to ask what does allah want from me what does allah want from me what's pleasing to allah that's the true sentence that's the true structure of a sentence that a slave says isn't it so when you when you start thinking in that way it's like i want to do that but in this context i'm in and this circumstances i'm in is that truly what's most pleasing to allah you know um and i think that's that's like a little mindset thing that's like how you start living like a slave like an actual slave where it's like, mm. what is most pleasing to Allah? And just one way it might apply, for example, is, you know, for example, there is the mas'ala or the, there's the issue of um, 
is is bad, right? Which is uh, wearing your clothes below your ankles for men. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's difference of opinion. You know, I think um, maybe in terms of numbers, the majority say it's not haram to wear below your ankles. It's it's you know it's disliked or whatever. But nonetheless, when you ask yourself what's more pleasing to Allah, it's obviously that you avoid something that is disliked. You know, yeah. so that's one way to apply this kind of thinking, like what is pleasing to Allah. Um, another way is like, I want to become a sheikh so I could do dawah. I have ilm. I can change the world through my ilm and this and this. And you build up this whole vision in your mind, right? But right now, right here, what does what's pleasing to Allah? It, it kind of maybe brings it more to the moment kind of thinking, mm. if you know what I mean. And it becomes less about you and your glory and your vision and your dreams, which can be very pleasing to Allah, but it also can be kind of self-serving, if you know what I mean. Mm. So that's just... Rational, yeah. Rationalizing the goal as well is, is paramount. Mm. What do you mean by I, that? So what I mean is like, <laughs> because you're focused on this end goal, mm. and let's, let's say, okay, your end goal is moving to a Muslim country mm. to you know, live your, the rest of your life there and benefit mm. off the benefits that you guys discussed on episode 49 mm. um, and that becomes because you're working towards it working towards it working towards it that becomes a promised land for you that becomes the the grass is greener sort of thing mm. um, forgetting that actually you're not picking a better life you're picking your poison because every situation every circumstance has its downsides mm -hmm. has its situation that you're also going to struggle and stress about the same way you're stressing right now Mm. Right, the level of stress, and Allah knows best. But Allah tests a person. We will not, we'll not test a person more than they can bear. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you were to put a number on that stress on your mind, mm -hmm. let's say it's eighty. Right. I know yeah. it's really arbitrary, but let's <laughs> say the stress level is eighty. Okay. Yeah. You're in the UK. You're stressed about the situation here. You're stressed about your life here. You're stressed about what's going on. Your stress level is at eighty. Mm -hmm. You solve all of those problems that you had here in the UK. Yeah. By going over to the UAE, mm. right? And, you know, for the first few months, oh my God, it's amazing. This is, you know, solved all my problems. And mm. then suddenly things start happening. Mm -hmm. Tests from Allah start happening, which are inevitable. Your stress level is back to 80. Right. Because it's different, different problems, mm. but they're causing you the same amount of stress and anxiety. Mm. And once again, there are other things that you've got in your mind. Oh, I could solve it by doing this, solve it by doing that. And you're working towards those things again. Mm. You are always stressed and you're always working towards things because in the mal or salah, there's always thing, stresses and then relief and then mm. stress and then relief. Um, and I think going back to why I'm holding this coin again, this medallion, is to remind myself that no matter what situation or um, struggle I'm going through, the promised land and the solution that is after it i'm after mm. will also come with its stresses and struggles and, mm. and tests because mm. that is the nature of this world interesting um, so it's kind of sweet. like don't run away from challenges because you're going to run from one type of challenge to a, just another type of challenge mm. but what's what's this is it what you're rewarded for and you're judged on mm. isn't the end result it's how you dealt with the, the the intention to change those things that weren't good for your deen right it's about pleasing Allah in those tests and challenges oh. because yes okay think about it this way uh, right now it's difficult practicing well is it difficult being a Muslim here I don't know but one could argue it's difficult practicing mm. your deen here. more difficult than or elsewhere in, perhaps yeah more, more difficult than elsewhere perhaps right mm. so you say for the sake of Allah I'm going to work my best to solve it yeah now whether you solve it or not Allah's going to judge you on your intention mm. right but let's say you solve it, mm. okay? Well, then Allah is going to test you with something else that's difficult for your deen. That isn't going to be, mm. oh, I just pick up a move. It's going to be something else mm. that you have to deal with mm. there and then. Whether that's, I don't know, like, okay, I'll say in Tunisia, for example. Uh, yeah, there's more messenger around, but can I grow my beard? Mm. You know, <laughs> little things. Mm. You know, and then suddenly the beard becomes a huge issue for me. Right. Uh, or can my wife wear niqab? They just banned it recently in certain areas or whatever. Mm. Can... Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So mm. no matter where you go, mm. there's always going to be those stresses and struggles. Yeah. And maybe for the, some countries are better than others, yeah. but it doesn't change the biological stress levels in your mind right? because you're mm. still stressed about something. Yeah, because it's, it's like subjective, basically. Yeah, it's, it's like, always there. It's relative to, like if you're living a chill life, you know, somebody living absolutely plush life, 
in Dubai, yeah, the the cli as the cliche goes, yeah, for them, you know, their you know their delivery taking you know thirty minutes instead of ten minutes could yeah. could be a big deal, right? Versus, so it's all relative. Yeah, it's all relative. The one mm. benefit that we have and the advantage we have in in developing this mindset mm. uh, and developing the Muslim mindset, as mm. you've coined, mm. is from going to an abundance to a lack of it with the right intention. So just by having this conversation, I've theorized that maybe I should strip down on the belongings I have. Mm. So I'm looking right now, as we've been speaking this whole time, I've been looking at this bookshelf mm. in front of me, right? Mm. And I'm, there's probably like, I don't know, 50 books here, right? Mm. And I've barely read any of them. Mm. But I'll see a cool book and I'll buy it. Mm. But I haven't read any of them because I've got an abundance of choice. So when it comes to, when I'm in the mood, yeah. the rare times I'm in the mood to read a book, I'll pick one up and I'll read a bit of it. And then I'll put it down. Mm. And then another time I'll pick up another book and I'll, you know what I mean? And I'll put it down. Yeah. And it's the same with everything. It's the abundance of choice again. Mm. Now, what I'm thinking is I could strip down on all of my belongings. I could sell all of these books bar one, mm. right? I could sell all of these books bar one, mm. finish that book first, then buy another one yeah. if I need to, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with every single bit of entertainment I have. Mm. I should strip it to have one thing mm. at a time and then focus on that complete that and then move on mm. otherwise nothing will ever get mm. read yeah so i'll never read any books take away gonna... take away first take everything yes. away then add one yeah one and then add one, one by one yeah and then add exactly. one rather than uh, you know adding three and then adding two and adding one yeah. and then adding five and etc yeah and and mm. you can make things last longer and i know i speak a lot about video games mm. because that was my upbringing mm. but the example i'll, I'll give you because it a lot of it is what I've learned from my self-analysis of how my mind works with video games. Because I was in Tunisia and I didn't have any other outside sources of entertainment or whatever. Um, I spoke. Did I speak about this in? Yeah, yeah. I, think I spoke about it here or freshly grounded. I can't remember. Mm. Um, I had one game I play all the time and I finished it a hundred times, but I still had fun. Mm. I still enjoyed it mm. because it was one thing and there was no choice. Mm. The older you get, the more m money you get, mm. but the less time you have. Mm -hmm. So you end up spending more, getting more belongings, but less time to mm. to, to to complete mm. any of them. And um, belongings actually take time away from you sometimes. They yeah. they also take mental capacity away from you sometimes in a way, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, it's true, man. And, and this is it. So like these books now, I'm thinking, well, if I was to sell everything I have and start bit by bit, yeah. then economically that's better for me because mm. I'm spending less money. Yeah. I could save money. Mm. Um, and just having that mindset with everything, mm -hmm. just trying to develop that one at a time mindset. Mm. Um, but what, what you're I, describing is minimalism. But uh, it, yeah, it could be right. It, I think what <laughs> I've never looked into it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've <laughs> this is this is what I said the other day to my wife that without realizing it, I've actually become a minimalist. Or not? I be, I don't know if I've become, but I am a minimalist. It's just I never used that word. I never really looked into that. But just the way I like to live my life and organize my life is actually very minimalist. So I think that's that's it basically. A, a good mm. book I think for minimalism is essentialism. It's pretty mm. pretty good, pretty practical. I think it's not too long either. It's a pretty good one. Well, it's gonna have to wait because I've got to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But no, it's it's an old one. I mean, and if you think about it, bro, like a lot of Alan, if we're coming full circle here, but there's people that are racing towards things that we're running away from, mm. and that is the reality of our generation. A lot of the ones that are, you know, practicing Muslims that are seeking to change everything mm. in their own lives, like people are still running towards dunya at 100 miles an hour mm. chasing you know cars and money and women and whatever mm. um thinking yeah that's that's going to bring them happiness and yeah we haven't reached that level of dunya yet yeah. but already we're having doubts about whether we're going to be happy with all of that yeah uh, i mean that, that that's ideal bro that's like alhamdulillah that's a blessing from allah that course. we can see it and you mentioned it earlier about marriage and me and my wife were talking about this. So me and my wife were sitting down yesterday and she said to me, I don't think anybody that got married the same time I did is still married. Wow. Like, honestly, she Whoa. said this. There was a bunch of girls that all got married at the same time as her and mm. 
as far as she's saying, as far as she knows, all of them are divorced now. Mm. And I had the same sort of conversation. I was like, I've been to many, you know, met many Muslims this year, many brothers my age. Mm. So many of them have been divorced. Mm. And I was just, I was gobsmacked. Like one of the brothers came to me, he, he, he spoke to me, he said, how, when you found your wife, like what was the process? How did you, you know, I said, well, X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, um, got divorced. I was like, how? And I, mm. I was c- confused because these are really good practicing brothers. And I yeah. couldn't understand why they would marry someone that was so incompatible with them. Mm. Like it didn't make sense to me. Why didn't you put it down on paper? These issues that you've got together, mm. they're so obviously they're not going to work. Yeah. It's going to create friction. Why did you not go down the fundamental route? Yeah. And it goes back to this uh, this concept that you mentioned earlier about choice, about having too much choice and then being be, being too picky. Um, mm. And then not only too picky, but then being dissatisfied very quickly mm. uh, and not valuing family mm. or marriage in the way that it should be. And mm. one of the things me and my wife came to the conclusion of is that a lot of people in this society, a lot of Muslims, they're getting married to compete with the non-Muslims in relationships um, oh, so, damn. <laughs> do you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm. Like, they're surrounded with people in relationships, with media about relationships, mm. with, and all of these relationships. And I've had this discussion at work. I said, "What's the point of you getting in a long-term relationship if you're not going to be with them forever and make that in, your intention?" Mm. And you know, people, people, the non-Muslims will say, "Well, you can get bored of someone, and things might not work out, and blah blah blah." Mm. And I was like, "Well, you don't, then you don't value what a relationship's meant to be about." And me and my wife said to each other, like. Fair enough, like being romantic and developing a connection with someone is all well and good, but that's not the purpose of us getting married. That should never have been the purpose. Mm. It should be to raise a family and to to uh, extend Islam and, and, and the Ummah and our lineage mm. beyond just us. Mm-hmm. That's the purpose. Mm. Um, Technically. Yeah. It's, not, it's not solely mm. because we want to be uh, a cute couple and have a flipping... Mm. Uh, a lifelong of romance like that isn't it is it mm. but because i think there's a subconscious chasing and comparison between oh we need to make it halal we need to make it halal or i want to be in a halal relationship mm. that's all it is it's basically halalifying mm. or trying to halalify something what, that's more like a casual version that, exactly mm. and, and one thing i compared it to because i went out to morocco mm. i had halal beer Mm. Right, it was on the menu halal beer and I had it and it tasted awful mm. and I said to her I said this is what relationships are this is what marriage is marriage <laughs> this day and age is halal beer because people's concept or understanding of what marriage is mm. is like basically they want what non-Muslims have but they just want to put a halal mm. stamp on it yeah so, and the truth and is it still that tastes awful the non-Muslim at least in the West or you could say non-traditional um, structure for relationships is that I think a lot of the time they kind of must be uh, short term or medium term. Yeah. They, yeah. They're they not really designed in a way that they are long term. So yeah. if you're trying to use that framework for a marriage in Islam, marriage is supposed to be like ongoing. So they're That's not it, really yeah. compatible, are they? Exactly. And if you think about it, like, okay, uh, you went to school here young, didn't you? Uh, sure you did. I went to year one, I think only. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you can imagine, like, okay, in year seven, eight, mm. nine, where people are like, what, like, in their early teens? Yeah. Early teens, and even maybe younger, mm. are getting into relationships. Yeah. Okay? And I bet you, you sit down and speak to them, mm. and talk to them about marriage. Are you going to marry her? Mm. Uh, I don't know. Like, what's that what, about? What, what are you doing this for? What, what, why are you here then? What are yeah. you, what, what's, your, what's your end goal? I don't know. I'm yeah. just, you know, just having mm. a relationship. I think at that this age, it. it's just... It's funny, I said at that age, but the reality is, even up until adulthood, it's kind of just following the norm, isn't it? So it's it, like, yeah, but these things are projected is, is... onto you, and you're following. Like, the, It's like, basically, they probably wouldn't say this, but if you say, oh, why are you doing this? They would just say, oh, but that's what people do. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> but also, also just blindly chasing the urges that are within them. Um, yeah, although I don't know and, if they have urges at that age, but yeah. Oh, I'm sure they do. Well, they've got if they have sexual urges, they're going to have a level of attraction that yeah. makes them want to be, you know, yeah. makes them want to enjoying chase, attention, etc. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and this is what's phenomenal because 
I think this is one of the subconscious dangers of living in this society and living in any society this day and age because it's it's the same thing in in the Arab world and the Muslim mm. world with the onset of you know uh, soap operas and mm. TV and music and whatever yeah. is that if you can't separate yourself between Islam as a religion as a way of life mm. and not as a stamp that you put on things mm. you don't just stamp things oh it's permissible so I will do it mm. You know, uh, because the because I'm trying to achieve the same thing that the non-Muslims have, mm. or oh, some some non-Muslim asks you about something if it's permissible, like yeah, yeah, it's permissible, we can do that. Mm. Doesn't mean we should. Mm. Doesn't mean we, you know, it's it's recommended. Yeah, it's what is the what is we are a different mm. mindset yeah. completely. It, we are yeah. thinking, we we have to think completely differently. We can't mm. just start thinking mm. um, about. Uh, halal haram halal haram mm. and that's it that's it it's just a book of rules to us we're, uh, mm. we're at this stage we're just treating the deen like it's a book of rules yeah. and it's not about mindset it's not about end goal it's not about purpose yeah 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 you know? it's uh, it honestly it goes back to the mindset it goes back to the mindset slash world view whatever you want to call it and if you again if you ask yourself about this uh, oh I want to make it halal and this and that that you, that you were talking about if you ask yourself, it, what would Allah be pleased with? Easily, you kind of know what to do, I think, isn't it? Mm. So, it's so many things, bro. Mm. So many things we've been attacked from in different mm. areas. And this is why I think with Mind Heist, and although Mind Heist might have not started with an amazing sort of, uh, with a defined goal, mm -hmm. I think it's developed into what the name suggests <laughs> yeah. straight away, you know, and we have been focusing on mindset and we have been discussing about how there is a mind heist essentially mm. on your mind mm. all the time from mm. all sorts of angles and if you can't step back and, mm. and, and look at that, and I think, yeah, with growth it's mm. really interesting because, yeah, I'm not going to deny that I've I've been part of that rat race and maybe I still am mm. to a certain extent. Um, why did I get married in the first place? Well, Allah knows best. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but it's interesting because the the brothers that you speak to that wanted to get married because they wanted to have a family, yeah, uh, and they you know their wife said their spouse was on the same page, mm -hmm. are the same brothers that are still married. The mm -hmm. ones that wanted to get married because it was they wanted a wife or they wanted a relationship or mm -hmm. they wanted you know to to expend their desires or whatever it is, mm -hmm. they're the ones that are struggling the most mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. right? And, and that that objective would influence the type of woman you marry in the first place isn't it so exactly, that would exactly. that would play a big role it would either a lot of the time it either makes you marry anyone mm. just to get the job done yeah i know it sounds really really blunt but that's reality <laughs> job done. or it ma makes you marry someone very superficial that 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 satisfies mm. those superficial needs only mm. so like very you know uh, an attractive mm. person but that's all really they've got going for mm. them you know i, I think it's like it follows the trend of like kind of just shallow thinking where it's mm. like, for example, a very basic, really, honestly, for me, it's common sense thing that this person uh, that you marry, you're going to spend 90% of your time with them alone in, uh, in your house, right? Mm. In your house with, with or without kids, you know, before kids or after kids, you're going to be just in the house. Okay. Now, do, do you want to pick a spouse based on what is good for when you're outside if you know what i mean like what other people are going to see and what's going to get you the the status or whatever it, it's completely illogical because that's only 10 percent of the time you spend outside it's just it's only logical that you would focus and design your choice of spouse if you like for the 90 percent of the time that you spend together which is indoors no one hears about no one knows it's just you mm. and them and you're you're either going to live together happily or not based on those things like those times isn't it uh, for me it just seems so common sense but i think this is the poison that that is going around which is everyone just shallow thinking i don't know and i think in the past maybe there were loads of people who also they couldn't they weren't really thinking deep they weren't it's not like they were coming up with alternative views it's just that the cultural norms of their society uh, set them up more for success than the now mm. and so they were followers just how today there are followers it's just that what they were following was better for them mm. and and they were and going back to that post that i was reading on reddit about 
you know, traveling historically, they were talking about how uh, lm- life was a lot slower. Right? Mm-hmm. Everything was slower back then. Mm. And I bet you experienced that in Morocco. Yeah. Uh, but this is, once again, I don't know if that's part of the lazy holiday vibe that I'm in mm. or just the general notion. Because, yeah, I always associate those societies with slower pace. Mm. And I think maybe they are. But mm. once again, I don't want to be biased because I'm in a holiday mode and I'm not mm. thinking about you yeah. know, real living. Um, but it reminds me, I'm, thinking, I'm reading or listening at least to a book called Stillness by Ryan Holiday. Once again, me too. I always talk about him. And, and yeah, th- and, and, and thinking about uh, this notion of instant gratification and that's all we, after all the time, is we want immediate results, immediate uh, uh, responses to what we do, immediate pleasure, immediate everything. Mm. Um, and even if you don't want that consciously, it subconsciously feeds its way into you through, you know, oh, I want a pizza, I'll order one. I want to, do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Everything is now, 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 now. Yeah. While societies before didn't have that luxury, mm-hmm. they had no choice but to wait. You plant a seed and you wait for it to grow. Yeah. You know, even something as simple as farming, bro, like a lot of people lived off the land before. Mm. And a lot of people still do. And mm-hmm. you plant and, you know, there's a time for harvest. There's a time for hibernation there's a time for eating this certain thing this certain Mm -hmm. thing is in season this certain thing isn't oh you want to wait for this fruit where you have to wait until next season yeah you know Mm. it's just and the profits incredible the profits uh is it all of them or a lot of them were shepherds you know yeah and that teaches you patience it teaches you closeness to nature teaches you um you know even kind of the emotional the emotional, just the, the emotional intelligence developed by spending time mm. with animals, even. Definitely. Um, these kind of things. But the thing is, bro, is like when we're having this discussion, we can, is, is bemoan, I don't know, bemoan the word, the right word. We can bemoan these things, but we live in this world, right? So it's like, of course. How do we, like, we're not farmers. I do not want to be a farmer, really. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. think I might enjoy it as a hobby, but not, not otherwise, right? Um, so it's like, obviously we, we can, at least we've got to the first stage, which is recognizing that this kind of, uh, lifestyle where you can access anything, anytime and all of that, we, we realize the negative things. Um, how do we go beyond that and like live in that world and, and then not fall trapped to the negative consequences of it? That's, this is it. Yeah. To provide, to provide answers, the first thing, like you said, yeah, is to identify it and to accept that you are a victim of it. Mm. A lot of people don't want to accept mm. that. I put out a poll the other day on Instagram saying, how do you, what do you think of your social media addiction? I didn't say, mm. do you have one? I just yeah. said, what do you think of it? Yeah, yeah. I, like, I, Cause I it's wanted assumed, to put it yeah. in people's minds that you've got one. Like, don't run away. You've got this thing. Yeah. You know, and there was a lot of brothers that um, replied that they they don't they're not worried about it because mm. i bro are you worried about your social media addiction Mo- large majority said yes they mm. are which is fine a lot uh, a small minority said no and some of the brothers that said no mm. were quite popular or quite active on on social media <laughs> um, well that makes sense yeah but it made me think but they've got you know a decent following and they, they're quite you know doing quite a bottle with it but they also have purpose to why they're on it and, and it could be business it could be whatever mm. um but one thing is to i think maybe going forward practically speaking is the stripping down of things turning into a bit of a minimalist mm. um the developing mottos to live by so fundamental sort of laws to live by in the sense mm. that yes there's a, principles there's a thing that or like, values or something yeah a principle and a value like okay here's one like if you can't i think it was jay-z that said it or something if you can't buy something twice then this you can't afford it okay so it's 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 just a principle whether you want to act on it or not it's it's an interesting principle like yeah. you want to buy uh i don't know flipping i don't know a, a, mm. a sweater, another another right? way to put it bro is uh maybe a better for example uh buying when you buy a car yeah like yeah. dave ramsey he's like a fi- personal finance kind of guy been been doing radio shows about personal finances for uh-huh. decades probably in the u.s he says if you uh, don't spend more than six months salary on a car yeah right and he says uh buy car always in cash now that kind of that's very narrowed down narrowed things down for you isn't it? it's like a good principle um 
yeah so something like that isn't it definitely definitely i mean mm. another thing is like avoiding debt um, yes which i i'm happy to say at hand alert i don't well apart from student loan um whatever whatever <laughs> that is i don't i don't you know, I, I, don't, I, I get scared saying this because then I might need to, something will happen and I'll be like, oh my God, I've got no choice. But I've, I've mm. always avoided asking mm. anyone for money. I don't mm. think I ever have. Um, mm. Allah knows best. The but thing is, yeah, bro, just, that, that should be the default, isn't it? Although that should be the default, but this is not what society is default. about. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about, about credit, borrowing, about get credit, it now, pay well, later. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm. So, you know, whether even if it's holidays and stuff, and yeah, I've dabbled mm. into... Um, you know payment plans for certain things and mm. uh but i've never you know you do it and think mm. oh it's here but then you're like oh why did i do this like mm. <laughs> you know but yeah that's another thing um mm. the way you so bro, back, the back way to you... the principles thing because i don't go, want go us to it. get lost no no I, i'm saying let let's stick to that <laughs> this is it yeah this yeah. is it but no, these are principles again yeah, yeah. like not getting into debt oh it's, yeah true, true. those principles mm. um yeah, like always, I don't know, obviously our religion gives us principles, isn't it, as well, to of follow. Course, like of course, uh, of course. always pray on time. Uh, or yeah. if you want to take it to a high level, obviously depending on your medhev, this might be the, the absolute minimum, but always pray in the masjid. Like, you know, yeah. all of these things. So it's true, man. Uh, the religion, obviously, alhamdulillah, gives us a lot of structure, a lot of, a lot of principles. Um, uh, even within the religion, though, you can pick certain things or not pick them. And it might not be obligatory for you to go follow this, but it's definitely from our religion, such as uh, leave that which gives doubt for that which doesn't give doubt. You know, mm. these are, for example, I, I now that I'm thinking about it, it's, it's 100% true. Uh, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi that he compiled and he put together, those are absolutely perfect as principles you know if you yeah, go through them if you go through the explanation you find hadith like the one i just mentioned you find in amal bin niyat like have don't live life on autopilot always have intention uh you find uh uh that which is halal is clear that which is haram is clear and between it are areas which are gray areas basically whoever avoids the gray areas has protected their honor and their mm. uh um and his, anyway, basically protect yourself from sin his and religion, stuff. Right? So again, that's that's kind of a principle as well. So yes, dinihi wa erudihi. Now, yeah. yeah. So so this is this is a, a great source of principles. I feel as well. Yeah. Of course, and everyone's, It'd be pretty cool to compile I mean, them. Even it, it depends on it depends on their end goal and and seeing. Oh, that was what I wanted to say. The main principle that I try and live by. Um, not the main mm. main one, but one that is, I've, I've thought about a lot is trying to have the mindset of someone that wouldn't lose their let, lose their head when they are um, granted with many blessings. So we mm. hear time and time again of you know mm. people that make it big or uh, you know get rich or they get famous or they get whatever. Okay. Yeah. And they lose their way. They become mm. wild. They end up doing all sorts mm. and. I've always said to myself that if I want my du'a to be answered, then I need to have a mindset of somebody mm. who doesn't lose it when he gets what mm. he wants, doesn't forget when he gets what he wants. So mm. I need to be more conscious of Allah. Obviously, if, I'm, if I've got you know, if I got a bag of money, then mm. I'm gonna I need to remember not to lose myself, right? But that means I need mm. to develop that consciousness now and cement mm. it into my into my my core muscle yeah. memory now yeah yeah otherwise when i do get that i'm gonna go wild yeah and whether you whether you say oh no you won't or not you don't know mm. until you get there right mm. and it could be and i say it time and time again it could mm. be that allah's preventing you from reaching those levels of dunya success that you want to reach because you will lose your way and lose your religion because of mm. it right just like many people have just like many people have so what does that mean uh in in real world scenario what it means is uh, the way you spend your money now. So, are you spending your money now on things that are for show? Where they're like, okay, let's say you want to buy some clothes. Are you buying something because you like the look of it, or are you buying it because you know other people are gonna 
think a certain way of you when you do it or mm. when you get something new are you first the first thing you do is show it off to people mm. or take a photo and post it on the gram or mm. you know little things like this um, mm. because if that's who you are now then god forbid what you're going to be like later on yeah when you yeah you, you've made it big and all you're doing mm. is showing off right mm. it's little th- things now because big small habits that you've got now in terms of your own mindset and the way you view yourself and you view life are going to massively increase the more wealth you attain and the more blessings that you've got given to you unless mm. you can control that now it's still little things as well even with dean bro let's say you've memorized a bit of quran right mm. or you've just worked on your tajweed the first thing you do is i'll oh, record a little video and put it up on on whatever <laughs> with that reciting. flipping echo that people put <laughs> yeah or something like that um now you've got to look into yourself and I'm not judging anyone who does that because there are people that do it for the sake of Allah and there's people that don't but look into yourself and I advise everyone to do it and I do it to myself all the time look into yourself why are you putting that up there if that's what you're doing now then imagine down the line when you're a famous mm. whatever guy yeah. or whatever and then what's your intention about yeah, yeah, yeah. and then have you perfected yeah. that same with dawah you're making doing dawah and you're getting a, a following um or people are liking your stuff or whatever. Are you still doing it for the sake of a lie? Are you doing it for, for the mm. sake of the likes and for the mm. sake of the share and all that? And mm. It's all about this intention game once again mm. because who you are now is going to be uh, times 100 when you're mm. either more wealthy, more blessed, mm. more famous, whatever it is, mm. whatever it is in the future. Yeah. Um, and have you, have you read the book Ego, Ego is the Enemy? Yes. Yeah, so... My, it's, the, at the moment, it's probably my favorite book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is actually exactly what you're talking about because I believe the first section, like the first third of the book is about before you get to success, um, how do you make sure your ego is in check even then um, yeah. to kind of prepare you? I think that the first third of it was about that. So that's that's kind of right in line with, with what you're talking about. And then... That's probably where I got it from, mm, but I can't remember. Okay. Like I said, mm. consuming so much that... But this year has been one of deep self-reflection, especially on this issue, and maybe sparked off by these books I've read, because mm. it's <laughs> it's putting things into perspective. Because yeah, your ego is flipping wild, mm. and a lot of it is going to be that shape on that that every one of us has. What do you say about my ego? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> oh there you go that's the first call for the podcast I've been holding it in all this time. <laughs> listen uh, um, listen Echi. I'm g- go I'm pretty much I'm pretty sure they already started Salah so oh no I'm gonna run uh, I'm gonna run to join inshallah uh, okay this has been a juicy good podcast Jazakallah khairan yeah, um I promise, I promise, I've, uh, now that I'm promising, I've got to actually do it. Next episode, we will cover those questions that came in on Curious Cat and stuff, inshallah. Cool. Um, and uh, go to mindheistpodcast.com and you'll find the links for the Instagram, for the Curious Cat Ooh. and the email Ooh, and all of really? that. Really? I need to check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a little simple page, but it has all the links in the same place. So that's uh, mindheistpodcast.com. And uh, I think we'll see you next time, bi'idhnillah. Ya Allah. Okay. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum assalam.